Hello everybody, my name is Hannah and today we'll be, we will be talking about Ghibli and why it is so bloody relatable sometimes. So, uh, forewarning, I am only going to be talking about Miyazaki films here. Uh, so the ones by other directors, which are also very good, uh, but I haven't seen most of them yet, so I can't really say a whole lot about that. Also, I'm not going to be talking entirely about Ghibli because I have Lupin the Third in here too, and that's technically not a Ghibli movie, but whatever! I make the rules around here. Well, anyways, let's get going! So, right off the bat, uh, big picture, the big idea, the main reason why Ghibli is so good at connecting its audiences and dragging its audiences into the movies is because they care about their audiences and they know what their audience wants. For example, in an interview for the movie Porco Rosso, um, Miyazaki specifically says, and I quote, Porco Rosso is designed to be a work that businessmen exhausted from international flights can enjoy even if their minds have been dulled from lack of oxygen. So right there, it's obvious that he was directing the movie Porco Rosso towards middle-aged men who are tired of work and he wanted to make a movie that would bring light into that world and it he would to make people happy and to to attract people who may not necessarily watch these movies in the first place. And because of that, their idea of how they build worlds is a little, it's almost backwards. So rather than making their world, making their story, and then advertising towards a certain age group of some kind, they figure out who their audience is going to be first, what they want to get out of this, what they want to give to their audience, and then they create a world that is designed specifically for that audience. Now, one of the most obvious ways that Ghibli films achieve this whole drawing your audience into the world type of thing is through the old trick of making a generic main character. Now, I don't mean in personality. This is where Ghibli excels in this whole thing, is that every single main character has a different personality, like entirely, and that's what makes their characters interesting. But if you notice, a lot of the designs for the main characters are fairly similar. And you could even go to say that they're fairly boring because there's nothing that makes them stand out. And if there is something that makes them stand out, it doesn't happen at the very beginning of the film. It'll happen later on after you have put yourself in the shoes of the character. For example, we have Sophie from Howl's Moving Castle, who starts out as just a normal girl uh, working in a hat shop, and then she turns into an old lady, and that is when her life changes completely. And so we connect to this character, because if she were to have already been cursed upon, and if she was already an old lady, we probably wouldn't be able to connect to her nearly as much as how it is in the movie. Now this isn't something that Ghibli made up or Miyazaki made up. This has been around forever and it's in pretty much every single genre. But what makes Ghibli so different and unique, like I said before, they have personalities that are unique. Their personalities are different. You can put yourself into the rut of making your characters too cool or too perfect or too good. And when you do that, they become disinteresting. So rather than drawing your uh, audience in, you're just turning them off because they don't care about these characters, but to make them care, you have to give them faults. And Miyazaki and Ghibli Studios, they definitely do that. They give their characters faults, they um, give their characters real emotions, and they make them react to things in very realistic ways. Which leads to my next point of being that Ghibli characters t generally are very desensitized to the situations that they're put into. So I found that there's a general theme in like American cinema that whenever a character gets thrown down the rabbit hole and they wind up in this new magical world, they immediately just want to leave. They don't want to be there, they just want to get back to reality as much as, as soon as possible. And something about that is a little bit off-putting. It's like, if the character doesn't want to be in this world, then why should we want to be there? And so when we watch a Ghibli film where the characters immediately fall in love with the worlds that they that surround them, we fall in love with the worlds too because we put ourselves in the shoes of the character and we want to experience this world the same way that the main character is. 
For example, in My Neighbor Totoro, when Mei first finds Totoro, she doesn't run away screaming. She excitedly tells her family about this amazing creature that she found, and they don't deny the fact that Totoro could exist. Like, even Granny in the movie, she talks about how she saw the soot sprites when she was younger, and now they're seeing the soot sprites. And it's not like it's a super unrealistic world. Like, if we look at Howl's Moving Castle, it's obvious. There's magic everywhere. There's the demons, there's Howl's Moving Castle. Castle, but in My Neighbor Totoro, it's completely different. It is based off of legitimate rice fields in Japan, and it's so realistic that people even would mail in letters saying like, did you base this off of my village? This looks exactly like my village. And because there is a world that looks so much like ours that believes in magic, we want to believe in the world. Also, if you notice that whenever you create a character that is very normal, everybody else seems to be a little bit off. If we look at Haku in Spirited Away, he technically fits the main character format. He's got brown hair, an average height, he doesn't have brown eyes, he's got green eyes, but that's not the point. The point is that if we compare him to Chihiro, if we compare him to her parents or to anybody in the real world, then it's obvious that he does not fit in anywhere other than the world that Chihiro is placed into. Another thing that makes uh, Ghibli characters fairly unique is that sometimes there's character development and sometimes there isn't. It all depends on which world we're talking about and whether that story requires the character to develop in order to experience the world to its fullest. So if we take a look at My Neighbor Totoro, you could argue that Mei and Satsuki uh, do have some character development, but I'm just going to say for now that they don't. because. That is not really the goal of the movie. The goal of the movie would be to let you experience Totoro and just have a fun time. It's not about uh, whether Mei and Satsuki become uh, stronger, m more mature kids. It's just about Totoro and it's about having fun and just a little bit of relief from reality. On the other end of the spectrum, we look at Chihiro, who is has a very obvious character arc. She goes from not wanting to move to a new town, not le wanting to leave her friends, and just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, her parents turn into pigs, leaving her all alone in a completely strange world. And now we have to figure out how she's going to get through this, and that's what makes these two movies very different. Totoro doesn't necessarily need character development because it's more about just having fun. Whereas Spirited Away is about getting through something, it's about overcoming obstacles, and it's about showing you that you can do it too. If Chihiro can get over her parents being turned into pigs, then you can get over that one time that somebody told you that you sucked at drawing. The maple leaf is a little more difficult to draw than your queenie flower, okay Chrissy? Aside from the incredible animation and the fact that you can literally stare at one frame for hours because there's so many freaking details in there, Ghibli movies often have very realistic looking setting. This has a lot to do with the incredible animation and background, but also just because they're always relating it back to real life and real history. Like in My Neighbor Totoro, uh, Mei and Satsuki's mother had tuberculosis, which was a very, very common disease at the time that this movie was being made. Now I'm not saying that you should give everybody a history lesson, but what I am saying is that you should always try and input little bits of your life and what things that have affected you in your life because what happens in your life is going to be different from every single person in the world. No two stories will ever be alike, so why not use that to your advantage? Last, but certainly not least, is something that I've noticed in a lot of Ghibli films that I've never really heard anybody talk about yet, so I'm gonna do that right now. I don't know what this is called, or if it has a name or anything, but for the moment I'm just gonna kinda call it, um, reality, because that's what it is. It's this idea that things never go as planned in life, and so if things don't go as planned in real life, then why should they go as planned in these make-believe worlds? I'll give you an example because I probably am making absolutely no sense at the moment. In Lupin the Third, Castle of Cagli... Castle of Cagliostro, there's this one scene where Lupin and Jigen are trying to get into the castle and they go through this like water treatment thing and they're swimming through it and Lupin swims a little too far 
and Jigen is able to grab onto the side of the wall, but Lupin swims too far and uh, almost falls over the edge of a waterfall, and then he swims back and he just about grabs Jigen's hand, but at the last moment the current picks up and it swip- sweeps him away and he falls off the edge of this waterfall. Now in any other movie other than a Ghibli movie, what probably would have happened would be that by falling off the edge of the waterfall, you would have died. So, in order to evade that, of course, Jigen would have grabbed his hand and they would have safely made it to the end and they would have gotten in the castle the way that they planned to get in the, to the castle. But this isn't any other movie. This is a Ghibli movie. So what Ghibli has to do is they give you something unexpected. They purposefully take the route that isn't predictable because they want you to experience a greater adventure. If Porco Rosso were able to defeat Curtis every single time they met, we wouldn't have a story. If Jiro in The Wind Rises, who is supposed to be some kind of genius when it comes to uh, building planes, if he were to have built this metal plane with no problems at the very beginning of the movie, then there would be no conflict. It would be an uninteresting movie. So technically what I'm trying to say here is that if you don't make your characters suffer, then there's no point. Or to put it a little less aggressively, if you want to do something unpredictable, then maybe do something that shocks yourself. Rather than going the safe route and finishing right at the last moment, don't finish. Don't grab your hands. Just fall and see where that gets you. Completely Ghibli unrelated, my, the author of my favorite light novel series, Bakuno, uh, Ryogo Narita, he said that in an interview somewhere that uh, he never drafts his entire series right from the very beginning. He doesn't know the ending of his stories when he starts writing them. And it's very apparent when he writes these stories because they're so adventurous, they're so fun, and you just like keep going through them, uh, never really knowing where they're gonna go next. And that's what makes them so fun. That's why I love them so much. And I'm fairly certain that Miyazaki takes a similar approach because I'm pretty sure he was on uh, um, Princess Mononoke extras, or maybe it was My Neighbor Totoro, I can't remember. But they mentioned something about they would start storyboarding, they would start animating before they would even finish the storyboard. And that's what gives them a really nice dreamlike touch. And it's what makes their movies what they are. So, as we wrap it up here, if there's anything that you should take away from this video, I think it's that you should always care about your audience. By doing so, create characters that people can relate to. And build worlds so grand that people trick themselves into believing that they might possibly be real. Alrighty, everybody, uh, that's all I got for you today. If you were wondering, this fan art is from Howl's Moving Castle. It is Howl and Sophie, and it's no scene in particular because, I don't know, I just kind of took things that I liked about each of the characters, like um, Sophie's hair and her dress and uh, Howl's black hair. I didn't really like his blonde hair. Sorry. Well, anyways, um, did anyone else find it a shock when they found out that Christian Bale voices Howl? Like, Batman and Howl are the same person? Oh my god! Anyways, um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening, day, I don't know. Adios! Mm -hmm.